Ladies and gentlemen, most, uh, most human beings um, wrestle with the existential angst of asking what the purpose in their life is. Um, you know, when we go back to philosophers or authors, uh, Sophocles, for instance, um, telling the story of Oedipus Rex, why am I married to my mother, um, to uh, Camus, Sartre, questioning their place on the planet, a universe with a God, a universe without a God, which one is more terrifying? I don't have any of those issues at all. I'm very clear on what my purpose was. You see, ladies and gentlemen, I'm an alibi. I'm a walking, talking, breathing alibi. And I'll park that for a moment. When you think about the idea of hope, if someone said, what, what are schools supposed to do? They're supposed to, more than anything else, grow good people and institutionalize hope. And when you look at a, an event like TEDx, it's a, it's a classic case in point. As a head of school, my job is, a, is to appoint people better than myself and allow those people to bring the best out in others. And the often misquoted Hesiod said in the 8th century, well, he didn't say it because we're not sure what he said, but the quotation of eff effectively paraphrasing anyway is that he had no confidence in the youth of today because they're unruly and that you can't trust the future of a nation to that group of young people. And we know, even though he's been treated like a pariah by educators for hundreds of years, it's just simply not true. And an event like this speaks in volumes about the manifest importance of hope. So what is hope? Firstly, who are we dealing with when we talk about youth? Um, Jim Clifton, who's the CEO of a survey group in the United States, wrote a wonderful book a number of years ago called The Coming War for Jobs. And in it, his thesis was effectively that the planet is 1.8 billion jobs short. That if you do not give someone a job, a purpose, a sense of industry, then sadly what you're institutionalizing is despair. And we know for the Elizabethans, the word despair was actually blasphemy because it was in their paradigm, it meant there was no chance of redemption. And in a sense, it's true. If, if you have no prospects at all, not just at the personal, but at the institutional, the national level, then what do you turn to? You turn to other ways of expressing yourself. So back to the way that I'm an actually an alibi. Um, in 1969, which is a memorable year because uh, John F. Kennedy put someone on the moon, or did he? Was it, was it a sound stage at Anaheim? I don't know. I'm not a conspiracist. Um, but we got Gore-Tex out of that, didn't we? Anyway, in uh, 1969, uh, I was born in May, and one afternoon, not that I remember it, of course, um, too traumatic, blocked it out, but my father didn't come home from whatever he was doing in the day. And so my mum, who was, uh, you know, an a, a incredibly devout sort of 1950s Catholic, uh, was awfully worried. I was the youngest of seven. And of course, you know, there were seven children in nine years. I said to her once when I was going through my Jimi Hendrix and Jim Morrison phase, which didn't last long, thankfully, what were the 60s like? She said, I don't know, I was pregnant for a decade. Um, but anyway, so he didn't come home. It turned out he'd actually embezzled um, a huge amount of money at that time. In net present value, I'm not sure what it would be, but lots of money from a co-op in the town, in northeastern Victoria, which for our international viewers in, is in the southern part of Australia. Australia is that country down the bottom. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, she didn't know who he was and to cut a long story short, he disappeared. He was uh, then found by police, arrested, put in prison. And here's where my reason for existence comes in. I'm building a bit of suspense here. Uh, these guys aren't buying it, but anyway. Um, so... <laughs> So the police were interrogating my mum and they said to her, Mr. Maruff, um, you are either one of the best liars we've ever met or you are unbelievably naive. And I think it was the latter. So then they said, where were you? On the 15th of May, 1969. She said, I was giving birth to that baby. My reason for existence, ladies and gentlemen, there it is. <laughs> I'm an alibi, walking and talking. Um, 
which I think is good when you've got purpose. Uh, so to cut a long story short, my father actually came home again after being in prison. And I remember saying to my mum, who was my, who was my dad? Ooh, we're not alone. Um, who was my dad in, you know, when we lived in the country? She said it was the same one. I said, well, fair enough. I didn't, wasn't too fussed. Um, but he, was, he came back and he was incredibly violent. So we were raised uh, in an environment of dichotomies. So on the one hand, there was this extraordinary kind of, you know, matriarchy like Rose Kennedy. And on the other hand, there was this kind of, um, you know, domestic Joseph Stalin that we were living in. And, um, and that was a real contradiction. And he would steal things and there were bags of cash and guns and all that sort of thing. So it was a very violent and tumultuous time in my life. Um, but as a child, you're so adaptable. Um, and we were evicted from a house that we found out later on that he actually owned. So that was nice. When I was, remember being at the age of 12, standing on the street crying, I was in year seven because I had nowhere to go. Um, like a dream, really. Remarkable. So what's it got to do with, with uh, celebrating youth? Well, if, if Jim Clifton's right and the planet's 1.8 billion jobs short, how many people on this planet are between the ages of 10 and 24? About 1.8 billion, apparently. So we've got some challenges ahead. In a school context, of course, what we're trying to do, as I mentioned before, is grow good people. And when you look at some of the research done out of the University of Rochester up in upstate New York, not just up the road, um, really we're looking at the whole idea of motivation, you know, competence, purpose, mastery, all those sorts of things. And we can talk about those on the sunny side of the ledger, but if we don't get them right on the other side, by golly, we've got some challenges. In my case, you know, to, to extrapolate my story out, um, I was in, and none of you repeat this please, I was in a class at a very forgettable technical school, and I'm not technical at all, believe me. Technical stuff is for others. I know my limitations. And, uh, and it was a very awful place I was, where I was at school. But when I was about 14, I, my mother's auntie died and left us a house. So we never owned a house before. Um, and so off we trudged to the other side of Melbourne, and I got to go to a half-decent Catholic boys' school in St Kilda, which, again, for our international viewers, is a pretty hip inner-city part of Melbourne. Um, and within three years, I was vice-captain of the school, I ducked humanities, I'm at Melbourne University. Um, so that really is a story of hope, but, you know, hope is like a cinder in snow. So it's very, very easy to step on. And I remember studying criminology and somehow talked my way into the holding cells of the Children's Court in Melbourne to do a little bit of research. And I remember speaking to these kids who were probably at that point not too dissimilar to me five years earlier. And, and they were, of course they were offenders, but they were victims. And I was writing a piece on the relationship between the juvenile justice system in Victoria and in Scandinavia. In Scandinavia, young people who offend are seen as victims and not offenders. But in our legal system, they're seen as offenders. And, and sure enough, they are. But once you look back at the whole kind of behaviour and what's been inflicted on these kids, in, then of course they're victims. Care and protection applications, wards of the state. And I remember speaking to one young man who was remarkably articulate. And he said to me, you're at university, you got access. You got access to be successful. I don't, so I've got to choose another path. You know, sad. It is so sad when you see that. So when we talk about celebrating youth, really what we're trying to do is develop the preconditions and the context to grow, to allow, as the Greeks would say, this sense of eudaimonia, as they called it, which sometimes is incorrectly translated into the word happiness, but it doesn't mean that. It means flourishing. Because flourishing doesn't mean you treat a child like an angora rabbit. And as far I don't know much about rabbits, but I, uh, angora rabbits apparently don't do much other than look pretty. And, you know, we, it, that's not our role as parents or as educators. Our role is to challenge, to put children sometimes in situations they don't want to be in. But constantly that whole, whole idea of, of purpose and autonomy and relatedness is critical to develop them to actually understand themselves and how they relate to others. But we know, I was reading a book recently by Tony Little, who's the head of a very well-known school in England. He talks about adolescence. 
as a metaphor driving down a country road with an overpowered engine, brakes that don't work particularly well, and a foggy windscreen. And, but what a fantastic time in young people's lives to celebrate. I mean, neurobiologically, it's a very important process that the brain's going through in that time. And I think when you look at schools, what we're doing is developing non-poisonous passions in young people. So we're allowing them to fall in love with things, but the things they're falling in love with are good for them, not bad for them. And that's the whole idea of, of, of institutionalising this approach to human capital and cultural capital. Um, and so beyond feeding and watering and loving a child, the next thing that you can do to them is educate them well. You know, we go back to the Roman question, what's better to get people to do what you want, force or inspiration? And arguably, it's probably a bit of both, isn't it? But we hope that it's inspiration. Although then we have the contradiction that in our culture, we still celebrate the charismatic constantly in terms of leadership. And yet we want everybody else to participate. So I think what that speaks to is, is the sincerity that we have to show young people. We've got to be honest with them. We've got to be honest with them, but also we've got to actually, in a sense, protect them and not treat them like they are 35-year-old adults. We want them to have fun. We want them to have the zest for discovery and learning, and we want them to fall and fail. We want them to fail. You know, as cliched as the story goes, Thomas Edison came up with 1,100 light globes before one worked. So we want them to have that tenacity and that expectation that, you know, if I miss, so what? And hence why things like these events, music, sport, the arts, are so critical to the development of the broad-based sensibilities for these young people. And when we look at, at I suppose, the next generation in this country particularly, there are challenges. When, you know, this country issued something like 12 million scripts for antidepressants and anxiety, antipsychotic and, and anxiety medication in 2013. Now, not that those people don't need that, I'm not saying that at all. But when we, we speak to our friend at Yale who says, Professor Brackett, who says 40% of his first year students are on some form of antidepressant medication. There are some real challenges for us there, and I can't answer that today. But, but I do know that the more open and honest and the, the more loving relationships that we have with these young people and the fact that we can show them what the possibilities are and that we institutionalise hope and a preferred future, then we are much likely to be more successful. And, you know, these kids are wa walking into a world where they're going to be working in 2070. These young people, 2070. You know, Steve Jobs says you can only connect the dots in hindsight. You can't actually, we don't know where this is all going. So all we can do is give them that sense of self-efficacy. We can develop their intellect. We can give them knowledge. We can teach them how to collaborate with each other, which really means disagreeing respectfully to get to the truth, not to win an argument. And that's all we can do. But the great compelling and cogent news is this that I think we can actually trust them with the future so here it is thank you ladies and gentlemen